Great, thank you, Brian. Thanks for that presentation. Uh, before we go to a more general and open uh, answer and question session, and, and uh, delegates, please let us know if you have any questions. Uh, Bearing in mind the challenges that you're facing as a county council around water and flood risk, do you think the Learning Action Alliance framework could be applied to some of the challenges that you're facing, particularly as a county council, or maybe you in terms of a uh, sustainable drainage officer? I think it's something that's delivered individually per locality. So yeah. we actually do have a Ashford Water Group as well. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting the difference uh, in the way they interact. So the Ashford one deals with more, uh, like I say, reactive issues, issues as they arise. Usually it's got to do with um, particular drainage like problems or issues with ditches or new development impacts. And, and we're responding in that way across all the stakeholders. I think it could have more power if it was like the EBS fleet situation if they decided we're going to proactively decide we're going to work on this as a policy development or we're going to address this issue. I could see that it could work, it would work like that. I think it, for us it is very much tied to the localities and what their particular geographies or soil types or situations are. Um, but I think it would be a good thing. Thank you. But, so we haven't yet got any other. Oh, we have just got one question that's just come in. First question that we have is, uh, and it might be for Hyman to think about possibly, but what uses do you envisage for grey water reuse, and how much treatment does it require to enable that to happen? So it might be it might be a, a joint answer. Simon, do you want to do you want to start? in terms of thinking about how grey water can be used and what considerations and level of treatment are you going to try and provide? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think I highlighted the four scales in one of my slides that we look at the design of the city at. So the neighbourhood master planning scale, the, uh, the streets, the parks and the buildings. And I guess the two, the two key ones that we're currently interested in are, are at the master planning scale and at the building scale. So at the master planning scale, uh, I flagged up the fact that we are now the proud owners of the uh, central area in Ebsleet. Um, we'll be developing um, the master planning for that central area over the next couple of years. And we think that's a key opportunity to look at a, uh, a neighbourhood scaled approach to grey water. Um, so that, that's a key opportunity and that's one way that we intend to pursue fully. At the building scale, you know, while we'll also look at the building scale in terms of that, the central area, we're also keen to work with the mainstream volume house builders to look at promoting um, the uptake of uh, rainwater harvesting linked in with grey water reuse at that at that level. And that's that's something that we're looking to start to pursue actions on in the, uh, in the new year, um, including a, a site visit hopefully early next year to look at a couple of case studies and precedents um, and, to, and then start to look at the action planning around that. Great, thank you. Uh, can I, Bronwyn, sorry to put mm -hmm. you on the spot. When you have discussions with your colleagues about the whole water cycle and what have you, mm -hmm. how far do you feel that you can go with regards to grey water? And I know it's a difficult element in that some of it might be controlled by building regulations, some of it might be uh, conditional planning, but how how often does grey water come in as a, as an opportunity? Bear in mind in, that you know, water in, just there. in normal in normal development, if it was pre Briam, if it was back when um, we had the code for sustainable homes, rainwater harvesting in itself um, was one of the factors, and so this was what we're we talking about ten years ago now. Um, we saw rainwater harvesting units being incorporated in, in general building and the house builders were assuming a cost about £3,000 per unit. But as soon as Code for Sustainable Homes went away, that requirement left and they did not want to front up the cost on an individual basis because, uh, because of the costs involved. So we very rarely see, um, well, I haven't seen rainwater reused 
proposed within individual developments. And I have only once or twice seen rainwater harvesting since we've been LLFA, statutory consultee. However, Otterpool, Otterpool's coming forward and the idea is that, that it will be water neutral. And so we are very keen to look at uh, harvesting of water from sustainable drainage features. Um, there has been discussion about uh, recycling. And I mean, it is possible other countries do it. Other countries have uh, a third pink line and that provides washing machine, um, outdoor use, etc. cetera. Uh, the only problem with uh, reclaimed water use or recycled water in that sense is there's probably a preference for it not to be human contact. So you wouldn't want to use it as a shower, but it's more than more than happy to be used in a toilet um, or even in wash, washing machines um, because you don't have any chance of pathway pathogens. Great, thank you for that one, Wynne. And, and Tudor, what, as facilitator for the Learning Action Alliance, were there any particular topics that got got challenging to discuss, or I mean, where where would where would grey water recycling and uh, 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 and water reuse all come up in a packing a packing order of contentious issues to discuss? Um, well, I think the grey water reuse was the contentious one, to be honest with you, because um, I remember distinctly there were one or two workshops um, where there were some um, of the stakeholders that were fairly adamant that this idea is not, wouldn't really fly very well and should be replaced by other ideas. And uh, yeah, I think that that's why I think rainwater harvesting is the one that um, people are fairly or have been fairly um, happy with, um, and and it, and it was an idea that got a lot of traction. Uh, but there there was definitely a lot more uh, resistance to grey water use, and I think that just I think that part of it uh, stems from the fact that a lot of people don't really understand how it works. Uh, to be honest with you, but that was one of the good parts about, uh, well, that's one of the good parts about an LA that you, you, you get to learn from from the people in the room that are, um, they have a lot more expertise on it, uh, about it and how it works. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that. So, moving on to the next uh, question from Karen, Karen Potter. She says, uh, thanks for a fantastic webinar. Uh, I think she's coming a bit left field with this question, which she says is a bit different. Uh, she says, how much as participants did you feel you were representing your own views versus your organisations at the workshop? Which is most appropriate for a local, uh, uh, sorry, a Learning Action Alliance? Um, I'm just trying to uh, get the full uh, question. And can't scroll down in it. So yeah, so if you just want to ask that in terms of how, how whether you represent in your own interests or the organisation, and what is the most appropriate for uh, the uh, Learning Action Alliance? Um, and I, I, I'd say, did it, did it present a challenge or opportunity? I think in the first instance you are representing, I am re representing how Kent County Council, what they would like to promote. But I do think it comes back to what Tudor said about you've got people there with other expertises and that, you know, I come from, um, you know, 30 years in the water, <laughs> water surface water management, three different countries. I come with a whole lot of other baggage <laughs> that I did share <laughs> on occasion. Um, but, but um, and, and that's useful for general discussion, but I think the outcomes still, it, you know, it does promote discussion, you know, what things across um, other colleagues that are around the table, but the actual outcomes, um, having an effective solution or proposal or, you know, like this issue on grey water, you are restricted to what the current possible policy or outlooks are. And um, you, they, you do need to know that, whether it's a constraint. So even though I think everyone should have a pink line in their house, doesn't mean it's going to happen. So 
there's um, reality as well. Great, thank you for that, Bronwyn. And, and Simon? Yeah, I would I would suggest that uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the discussions that happen during the forum you then take back to the organisation and you know discuss some of the points raised back with with the maybe the planning team or the project delivery guys and then you kind of feel you you kind of bounce the ideas around and then you take that onto the next forum so I guess there's a constant balancing between your personal view the organisational view and kind of growing the two together and that works as well with the with the forum membership you're constantly listening to other other viewpoints and uh, and combining the two great uh, and Tudor do you uh, how, how do you feel that things were did were were there how how people were behaved in terms of their their views and perspectives and, and were there many uh, were there many issues with hidden agendas at all <laughs> I, I think that overall, uh, um, I think that what's uh, very important to stress is what um, I alluded to earlier on, and what uh, Bronwyn really, really um, hit in the in the head, that it, hit the nail in the head with, is that once people are in the room, the interaction is quite nice, um, and it, it's it's a very beneficial uh, and it's, very, it's like a flourishing environment, I would say. The problem is <laughs> around getting them to be in the room. Because of all the issues we've stressed, uh, we've, we've we've discussed. I I think that um, so there's there's a few anecdotes that I, I specifically and vividly remember in, in terms of the interaction between the between the different uh, stakeholders in the room. So I remember in the first uh, meeting, which was in February 2017, th there was somebody from transportation that just came and said, "Well, this does not." Uh, influences in any way which is we're just about transport so this is about water and then the planners in the room were like no actually whatever you do influences us as well because look your track goes there and there and then if it gets flooded or whatnot then it impacts us as well um, so that's you know that's kind of one of those that's a, an anecdote to kind of capture uh, a, a bit some of the some of the atmosphere in the room so I've, I've been I've been part of all of them and, and for most part it's just simply it's kind of like well, this is I think one of the benefits of the system dynamics model is that it forces a very specific question that it's answered fairly differently from, from uh, uh, by different stakeholders so as you as you said Bronnie would come from her perspective a planner would come from their perspective and so on and so forth um, which meant that there was a lot of Yes, I agree with that, but there's still this element, and there was another element put on top, and another element put on top. So there was, uh, that was the kind of ep epitomizes the interaction, uh, as far as I'm concerned. But there was also other hidden agendas. I remember specifically that somebody, I, I already shared this anecdote about somebody saying that uh, some of these things around rainwater, uh, rainwater harvesting can be done, you know, as equations on the on the back of an envelope, and I, and that kind of sparked a, a, a massive discussion. I think that. They kind of came as a as sort of an engineer working in a consultancy, and then they were like, "Well, you know, everything needs to be very precise, and there's a very precise problem with a very precise solution." And it was kind of the opposite of what we we're trying to do. That where we we're trying to think in more uh, wider strategic terms. Uh, but for most of it, I think that um, sorry, I'll try to keep it short. Um, I think that it, as as Brown we said in the beginning, it was a bit of a confusion because as I as I said, we were trying to innovate, we were trying to do something different, an LAA that hasn't been really necessarily been done before, and there wasn't much experience with. You know, this is a concept that not a lot of people have experience with, and hasn't really done much. So um, there was a bit of more confusion. But as we got towards the end, uh, the atmosphere got really uh, productive. I would say. Great. Thank you for that response, Tudor. I'm conscious of time, and I said we'd be finished at two. It's now one minute past. So I, I, I'm afraid we can't uh, pick up the questions from Vicky and, and Karen, but I just want to thank Tudor, uh, Simon, and Bronwyn for doing a really, a really good overview of the value and benefits of a Learning Action Alliance from a different perspective. Uh, and Someone has asked whether the presentations will be available. I will work with the coordinators at Nottingham University for the Urban Flood uh, Resilience Project to see if we can share the presentations there. I'm assuming it's okay with the presenters. Uh, 
but I also uh, want to highlight that uh, we have the next uh, webinar on looking at uh, collaboration uh, uh, to become more water resilient in Newcastle, which will cover uh, a, a longer time period uh, in terms of how the learning action lighters work there, and that will be on the 17th of December, and then two days later, uh, later after that, just before Christmas shopping kicks in, we have series has a webinar on better water management through the planning system, where we talk about recently launched guidance about uh, the planning process and how that can help deliver better uh, water management. So. Thank you uh, to everyone for your attention, and especially uh, thank you to uh, Tudor, uh, Bowman, and Simon for that. So thank you. Cheers, Paul. Bye. Thanks, everybody.